Hello, members. Tom Morrison from Metal Treating Institute right here in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm excited today to have Michael and Bill with us as we're going to talk about the fun things you like to talk about, which is legal stuff. Everybody wants to talk about legal stuff. So, um, but I want to uh, inform everybody that uh, to the to your right hand side, you can see where it says uh, say something nice. That is a nice chat box. If you hear a comment from Bill or Michael or myself that you would like to get um, further uh, uh, comments on, feel free to stick your uh, cursor down there and type that question in. I'll be monitoring that as we're talking, and I will ask the panelists uh, any of those questions that y'all might want to have. But you can see up there, I said, tell us where you're listening from. I, we're listening from Jacksonville, Florida. Would love for any of you to stick your cursor down there and type in where you're listening from so we, the panelists, can kind of see the cities and states where you come and might address some issues that, uh, that come to your state. But uh, we appreciate everybody coming in for this 30 to 45 minutes to just hear a big issue surrounding what we are learning in the heat treat world, which is NDA agreements. And as uh, Bill Disser will talk about, an extension of that is uh, dealing with your competitive with your employees and employer relationships as well as they may walk away from your company or get fired and they have your intellectual property right here in their mind. So, so, let's, so about a board meeting or two ago, we were talking about some things that uh, members are really struggling with. And somebody mentioned the, the is having to start signing NDAs on a per project basis, not just doing business with the company. And so it was talked about the board and, and Bill jumped in and made some good comments. So what do you think happens in one of our board meetings? The president looks in and says, well, Bill, would you, would you chair a task force that could look at that issue and maybe come up with some good documents that we might be able to look at, just like we have with our statement of limited liability? Um, before we get into that, what I'd like to do is, is, Bill, if you and Michael could just share just about 60 seconds on just who you are for our audience, they can get to know you a little bit. So, Bill, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about Bill Dissler and where you're at. Okay, first, hello, everybody out there, and uh, thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, again, Bill Dissler, I'm the CEO and president of AFC Holcroft, part of the Eichling Group, and I've been in the uh, heat treat industry for 30 years as of this year, and uh, with a couple of jaunts into some other business-related uh, businesses along the way. So. Through that time, I've certainly seen a lot of the, the legal documents that we're going to be talking about today, both from an employee standpoint, how you reasonably man manage uh, employees and customers. So hopefully I can bring some of my experience from around the world and uh, here in the United States to offer some of the compromises we've found work for us with uh, uh, legal going on with our customers and employees. Bill, thank you very much. Michael, what about you? Uh, my name is uh, Michael Anufrecht. I'm a partner with the law firm of White & Williams, uh, based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but with offices in uh, New York and elsewhere in the Northeast. Um, I'm an attorney who uh, mostly does commercial litigation, which is to say business disputes. Uh, I've represented manufacturers and even heat treating companies in the past. Um, I've litigated many of these documents that we're going to uh, discuss today. For the past uh, few uh, weeks and months, I worked with Tom and Bill and others to draft the documents and the best, best practices, and I'm pleased to discuss them today with uh, some of your members. Awesome. Well, Michael, thank you. If everybody doesn't know, Michael uh, with White & Williams, they're the company that also designed the statement of limited liability that we everybody puts on their documents uh, up to 10, 12 years ago, so we appreciate their involvement in that. So, so let's jump into it. Bill, let's go to you first. As a member, a guy running a company, and you're dealing with this legal stuff from a business owner's perspective, president's perspective, the 30-foot view of everybody listening, what what should they be concerned about? What Why are NDAs and these connections with your employees so important in protecting your business? Well, I think when we started out uh, on the board, as you mentioned, Tom, uh, talking about this topic on behalf of all the members of MTI, you know, the big topic started out being NDAs and the requests we get from customers to protect their information. And as we started out with that, what seemingly simple point, it really starts tying into many other aspects of how we have to conduct our business. And as a result of the team being put together, um, that, that simple document we thought we would start with as an NDA grew into what you're seeing here is six different documents. So as we go through the journey of, of, I think, how we have to try to look at protecting ourselves as business owners or managers, um, the first thing to remember, if we're signing NDAs, which are more commonplace with our customers, we're signing up to a responsibility to put our best practices in place to protect their information. 
So obviously we have to start thinking about, have you conveyed that responsibility to all of your employees? And if you are challenged on something like that, do you have documents in place that prove that you've demonstrated that to your employees, that you have an obligation to protect information uh, that is disclosed to you by customers? That obviously then jumps into, what about our own intellectual property? And those same practices should hold true with that. Um, as a result of that discussion, we've tried to take uh, what could be a fairly large set of topics and boil it down into a few documents that I think uh, for the MTI group should should uh, work as a very good framework to minimize the risks uh, with customers and with employees. So the task group that we had together spent quite a bit of time with you, Tom, and, and Michael and his law firm, and um, the result were, was a document set we sent out today. Bill, what, what level... I mean, when someone's coming to enter your plan, I think people on the line might be going, so at what level, when do we think we need to engage an NDA? I mean, is it when someone just comes in the business to get a tour? Is it someone just coming to talk to us? When do you feel as, an, as someone running a company, and, and we'll get Michael's perspective in a little bit, but when do you think an NDA is absolutely required? Well, I guess how, how I look at this, and, and, and um, I think the way I view this is the building blocks of, of all of the management of confidential information, be it our customer's information or, or our own business confidential information starts with the building blocks of when you engage an employee and how do you protect and establish expectations with these employees. So I would say the, the process starts internally with your employees, making them aware of, of your expectations and protecting that information. At that point, as you have customers come in or other consultants potentially come in, you have to look at those as individual lines that you have to protect with. Um, sometimes uh, you'll have a customer saying, hey, I, I want to disclose information to you, and here's my NDA. Um, we'll talk, I think, in some of these documents about some of the, the, uh, the mines we want to try to avoid if we use a general term, things that we common see that you want to try to avoid if you can. But often what I've seen in organizations is the, the NDAs get put in place with your customers and, and with other, other external organizations, maybe at the management level, but we forget to engage our employees with their responsibilities to protect it. Well, that, I mean, that's right, because I mean, I, I mean you're, you're one of your biggest employees, one I would assume, they leave and they go work for your biggest competition. They just walk away with all your intellectual property and you had nothing protecting them in your company in the file, correct? Well, not, not only our intellectual property, but potentially our customers' intellectual Correct. property, which we've legally tied ourselves to a responsibility to protect. So if we could say hypothetically an employee leaves and, and talks about something they shouldn't have talked about, and you get feedback from that customer saying, hey, uh, you weren't supposed to talk about this project, and you had somebody that leaked it. Right. Uh, my view of it is, I want to make sure that I could demonstrate that we had best practices in place to protect that information. Life isn't perfect, so we, we could have some cracks in the armor, but the idea is I wouldn't want to try to defend myself from a standpoint of saying, well, yeah, you know, that, that employee should have known that your information was confidential. The question could come, and, and Michael could probably speak more to the legal aspects of it, but what have we done to bind our employees to protecting our data and our customers' data. Right. So those are the building blocks that I think are often forgotten. So Michael, from a legal perspective, you've gone through this process looking with us and everything, and you, you, you pretty much understand our industry in this. So what is the 30,000 foot view of how much should members be protecting themselves? When should an NDA be engaged? Kind of address some of those issues Bill's been talking about from your perspective as the attorney. Uh, well, uh, it's very important for your members uh, to protect themselves nowadays because everything is on a computer. And uh, many employees, uh, for instance, salespeople, have a company-owned laptop, and they'll have a lot of information that's uh, easily exportable um, and that uh, they use that computer every day, and they take it with them, and they keep it with them, and that computer can be anywhere in the United States while they're making uh sales call. So the volume of information and the detail is taken for granted. Um, so what we see more and more often 
is the use of uh, uh, employment uh, documents that are countersigned uh, by the employee at the inception of the employment to make it clear that uh, virtually all the information that the employee comes into contact, contact with, whether it be of a technical nature or as Bill says, information that doesn't even um, necessarily belong to the employer but belongs to someone else or sales information or pricing or whatever it is, is considered proprietary by the employer and is held in confidence. So uh, one of the tasks that, that we endeavor to perform with the task force over the last few months was, uh, and I was given a, approximately a two page limit to draft a generic employment enga employee engagement letter that uh, could at least be a basis to be used across the board with uh, different employees. Um, so you can imagine if you were uh, going to ask a senior managerial level employee to sign a document, it might be more detailed than the one that's in your material. And if you had just uh, employees working on the line, it could even be less. But the one that we um, endeavored to draft is, is in the middle and the provisions can be used to protect the employer and in particular, the information. If you look at that document, you'll see that one thing it uh, uh, illustrates is that the employment is at will. Um, so that makes it clear that the employee can be hired and or fired at any time for good reason or none. But after that, the document lists in some detail uh, that everything will be considered uh, confidential. The document likewise restates the duty of loyalty that exists naturally between the employee and the employer. And then there's provisions in the document that would prohibit the employee uh, from soliciting his fellow employees after he left the, uh, the business to try to take those employees with them or to try to uh, remove information from the business. There's also a non-compete in the uh, document. Now, the non-compete is not as strong uh, as it could be. Uh, non-competes are uh, often red flags for potential employees. Uh, they can be difficult and expensive to uh, enforce and how they're treated varies from state to state. Uh, the state uh, where I'm sitting in, in Pennsylvania, um, generally favors uh, non-compete and will uh, enforce them as long as they're reasonable in terms of the duration, uh, in terms of the geographic uh, scope, and, and in other respects. Um, the last provision in the contract uh, speaks to uh, whether or not uh, an injunction would be granted. So we have cases uh, today in, in my office where a, um, a salesman, for instance, will have left one company and uh, moved to another and has his laptop and has a lot of information and wants to take the customers uh, with him. In that instance, the uh, former employer would have to go into court with an attorney and sue and seek an injunction at the outset of the litigation. In other words, the uh, majority of the case would not be over money, which most lawsuits are over money. This one would be to recover the information, um, to make sure the computer and other like uh, company phone and so on and so forth is um, returned and to make sure that the um, employee abides by the contract and doesn't take business, doesn't take the customers and doesn't solicit others. So that's, that's the NDA concept illustrated with regard to employers or employees that is the, the first part of the work that we help the task force perform. Well, just so everybody knows, uh, you should have received a copy of the set of documents that are in two places. One, I emailed the packet to you and there's actually five, I think it's five critical documents. One, the first one is the best practices for you employee employer relationship with the employee engagement letter right behind it. And then you have the best practice of you signing an NDA for a big customer or a big company who typically wants you to sign all their, their various forms. And behind that is a simple one page NDA that you could use as a template for someone just visiting uh, your plant, talking about stuff. Behind that is a three pager that is a more extended version of, of sharing actual intellectual property. And the last document is a simple document you would want to have somebody sign if there's ITAR work involved. So those are 
in the packet. And if you go out onto the MTAP website and uh, log into your members only and go to the resource library, you'll see all five of those documents are searchable and downloadable from the website as well. So Michael, that, that brings up a great point. Someone goes, or let's say you're going to let someone go who has that laptop and it's sitting on their desk. I've had crazy stories where someone on, you know, my Facebook friends would say, I just got let go from my company today. And they literally escorted me out of the building from the conference room, out the door and said, we'll send you everything. You, you know, they said they told them to bring their purse with them, but they said, we'll send you everything that's in your office that's yours next week. So what's your best practice advice of, I mean, some, you're going to let someone go on that end. How extensive should you go in that, in that moment of when they leave to protect you what you have? Well, um, the story you tell is, is not unusual. Um, one thing you should remember is that laptop is owned by the company. Uh, that uh, cell phone uh, may be owned by the company. And um, there are uh, cases or negotiations over exactly what happens to that laptop and that phone. And if the company has IT people or can, or can hire a vendor, if it doesn't have IT people, uh, those devices can be uh, scrubbed of any information uh, that, that uh, exists that belongs to the company. The personal information uh, would belong to the employee and there's uh, services that can, or vendors that can distinguish uh, between the two and uh, act uh, fairly and properly. It's not unusual um, for the employee to purchase the uh, laptop or, or, or another device for a nominal charge at the uh, conclusion of that uh, transaction. Um, but in, in this day and age where um, employee can um, uh, download in, into a, uh, you know, a, a portable uh, hard drive uh, information, you can't be too uh, careful. When, when we're in court uh, litigating these issues, um, we often uh, try to get a court order uh, to go out and look at the um, uh, computer information and to hire a vendor and pay them often a good sum of money to uh, check it out and to absolutely make sure that uh, what belongs to the company stays with the company. Right. Well, given the sounds behind you, I would I would realize I would understand it. Laptop. <laughs> if either one of you had to run out of your building right now, we would totally understand. <laughs> That's just, that's just a siren here in uh, in Philadelphia. Right, right. right. Now, Tom, maybe I can address a couple of sure. things at a slightly higher level instead sure. of getting too much into the details. Um, uh -huh. Stacey here I see in a note had a, as we're talking about uh, employee engagement. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for, for everyone that's online now, um, the first document that's in the PDF that Tom sent out is kind of a best practices for metal treaters for employer, employer to employee um, uh, things to think about. So I guess the question that Stacy mentioned here uh, online was, could this be in an employee handbook? And I guess before we get into the details, the, the, the board, the, the task force on this, and, and as we all talked about it, uh, there's many ways that I think the, the employer, we as the, the managers of a company, uh, can in can put some some legal ease between the employee and the employer. Many companies have an employee handbook. Um, we have an employee handbook as an example, and we do have, when we hire somebody new on board, we have them sign that handbook. And that handbook should be a lot of other things with discrimination, other internal things that you wanna have as a company policy. Certainly, that is not a bad place to have these responsibilities for the employee being embedded. And if they're properly placed there and signed, that can be one nice package that encompasses all this. But I think everybody should look at uh, an employee handbook, see if this is in it. If it's not, consider adding it or consider a separate document. In this case, we're talking about an employee engagement letter. You could call it something else. Um, we happen to not like the language in our employee handbook. And over a couple of decades, we've had employees brought on board we chose to recently go out to all employees with a separate document reminding them of their responsibility of managing both customer and our own intellectual property and had them sign a separate document and we keep track of that. In addition, I, I might recommend that you send out a reminder once a year of the responsibilities. Again, that would demonstrate some best practices that you are doing your best to remind employees of their responsibilities. But 
Uh, just so everyone understands, there are different ways to to put this legal uh, the, the legal paperwork between you and your employee. Employee handbook would be one of them. If you don't have that, a separate document uh, would be very appropriate. It's not an unreasonable thing to ask of an employee. And I'd say also if they uh, they don't want to agree to it, then you should ask yourself more questions as to why, because it's a very reasonable request. Right. Michael, wouldn't you say the employee engagement is really, because, you know, employee handbooks can be very thick, and Bill, as a best practice, wouldn't you say another reason to have it as a separate document is it really gets the employee to focus on the six or seven key things that protects your customer information, your customer's customer's information, and the intellectual property that you all bring in view while you're working. So the, the two-page document really says, look, this is what's really important. Everything in the end manual is important, but you have to understand these six things right off, instead of it being buried in the employee handbook. Yeah, but again, I think we're favoring, and I think legal would probably also say, hey, a separate document is the best way to go. But right. Also, in this document has other things that uh, I know our, our employee handbook didn't have, and are important to make sure that, that to the to, to your employee, there's a mutual understanding of, of what our responsibilities are to our customers and what our expectations are of them to, to uphold our obligations. Um, even having something like this clearly in place, and I know from a legal standpoint, we could talk about having to take a, an employee that leaves with a laptop or intellectual data court. Um, frankly, our view is we'd rather never get to that point um, another thing I think for all the MTI members to think about is even having a document like this in place, and if you really can put your hand on your heart and say, I've, I've taken all the right steps to, to be clear with our employees what expectations are, and uh, that employee leaves to go work for a competitor, um, if you start seeing activity on the other side, um, sometimes it could be uh, an approach to remind their new employer that this employee that they just hired is bound under confidentiality and that although you're not aware of any activity, we certainly hope we don't see any. Sometimes a nice little letter like that doesn't have to necessarily be from a law firm, but it could be, uh, might remind them that uh, the data that they may have left your offices with is not the next employer's to use. Right. That's a good point. So, so Michael, Bob Hill, one of our members in Pennsylvania, I know there was a lot of discussion <clears throat> in one of our task force meetings on how mutual or one way do we make the agreements. And he's got a great point of how, you know, how, how do uh, NDA, uh, you know, a mutual arrangement. Uh, I, I, I see that. And let, let me, let me just uh, add one thing to what um, Bill said on the last topic. Uh, I agree with him. I, I favor, a short agreement with, with each employee that restates uh, the duties and reinforces confidentiality, non-solicitation, non-compete, and the like. But it's not a substitute for the employee handbook. And if you look at the best practices, you'll see a number of additional provisions are um, suggested that could be included um, in an employee handbook, which would make them um, uh, potentially enforceable down the road. Uh, one of them, interestingly, Bill, the last one is uh, notification of new metal treater, which says in the event that an employee leaves the employee, employee of the metal treater, employee agrees that metal treater may and grants to metal treater the right to notify employees new metal treater about employees rights and obligations under this agreement. And, and I share your desire to settle the matter uh, short of litigation and the letter you suggested that's contemplated that by that paragraph um, it is, is, a, is a potential way, way to do it. Um, turning then to Bob Hill's uh, question, which is a, a different topic and concerns some of the other uh, documents, um, I, I think about con confidentiality uh, with a customer. So when you have a customer who's in a different state and it could be a bigger company than your company, you might be presented with a form or you might uh, have lawyers negotiate an agreement or principals negotiate an agreement. And uh, an important 
a portion of that agreement is what law applies and uh, what venue applies. And Bob Hill um, has um, hit the nail on the head here that sometimes that's a real battle to try to get the state law you pr prefer, your home state, for both the substantive law and the venue. Um, the best practices for um, dealing with your bigger customers uh, addresses this topic uh, in, in some uh, detail. Um, the most obvious solution is, is to negotiate and stand firm and you know, insist on Pennsylvania or Michigan or, or Ohio law uh, as the choice of law and, and, and the venue. And uh, if, if uh, the other side is unreasonable or they just have a, a lot more bargaining power than you, um, you know, you may be you may be stuck with um, another state's law or another state's venue. Um, you know, there 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 may be uh, no, no way uh, to to get your way uh, on that on that issue, or you know, it might be a trade off. I mean, everyone hopes, as uh, Bill suggested, that it never comes to that. Uh, but if it does, um, those uh, provisions are very important. Um, the most, you know, the first thing is is to be aware of it. If if, if you know you don't want to uh, wake up a year from now or two years from now and have a dispute and find out that you've agreed to venue in Kansas. Um, so at, at least at least be be aware of it, um, so so that you're you're prepared. Um, you you yeah. can always ch challenge venue in, in court. Um, but it's very difficult to overcome a signed contract um, that has a negotiated venue provision in there or substantive law um, unless those provisions themselves are the uh, subject of, uh, of fraud, which ordinarily they're not. In other words, it was somehow slipped in uh, with, with you being unaware. Um, but, you know, to answer uh, Bob, Bob Hill's question, uh, you know, the only the only way to um, be be certain that you won't be hauled into court somewhere where you don't want to be is is to negotiate it out of the contract at the beginning, and, and sometimes it's just not possible to do that. I I will note to the uh, group um, in the third document, which is called best practices. I think Michael uh, referred to this a little bit, but. Um, if you looked at the best practices for signing one-sided contracts with your biggest customers, for instance, this can be a number of contracts, but um, jurisdiction is a big area that we talked about uh, with the task force. And item three, if you take some time to look at this uh, either now or later, talks quite a bit about that. And I think Michael hit many of the items, but don't, don't forget a bigger company is going to pick a venue that they may have a lot of control in. Right. Corporate entity. And, you know, these courts are going to, you're better, it's never perfect to, and easy, but if you can get your local jurisdiction, if you think is favorable to you, that's maybe the best way. And you've got to know your states, I guess, too. But um, this is addressed quite a bit in the best practices with some suggestions to try to minimize the risks. So uh, Bob Fair made a good comment that it looks like some of the best practices were written directly so we could put them in the employee handbook, some of those key topics. And I think that was one of the things that the task force really tried to pay attention to, to, to have Michael and his team put together these clauses and phrases so you could just insert them in if you don't have them. And one of the things we tried to really work hard at is make them very user friendly. If you look at the employee engagement letter, the, the places where you put in your employee's name and your, employee, your company name and your address. It's a, it's a PDF fillable form, so you don't even have to write it in chicken scratch. You can literally type in the name of your employee, their address, your company name, print off, and then have each of you print and sign your name and date it, and you now have that employee engagement letter, which kind of leads me to one of my questions, Michael, and maybe, Bill, you can answer this as well. So our average company has about 40 to 50 employees. Some may have no NDAs for their non-competes for their employees for any of them, so so would you recommend at some point they have every employee in some fashion sign on lease? They've got one in each file. And at what level do you have your furnace operator to have one? Or the, the senior vice president of sales? I mean, who do you have signing these and when would you go about it? 
Well, um, you have to be careful about that. Um, you know, we hear about um, uh, a, a case or an incident where uh, an employer thinks he got burned by an employee and he's mad and he wakes up one day and he decides I'm going to have everybody sign right. a non, a non compete. I'm going to have everybody sign a confidentiality agreement. And uh, that's for five years, right? <laughs> The problem with that can be that it's, you know, it's a contract like any other and a contract like any other requires some consideration. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not an enforceable contract unless there is some consideration, uh, you know, normally money changing hands between what one side and another. So if you're going to implement a new policy, uh, you just can't go out and, and do it one morning and demand that the employee, whether it's senior level or, or not, come in and sign uh, for nothing. Um, the most obvious way to do it is to institute a new policy, and when people are hired, give them the package of documents you want them to sign it at the outset. Then there's consideration. It's the job itself, um, and, and that one is easy. Um, to try to... Um, change the terms of the contract or implement new contracts. There has to be some event um, that takes place that justifies the employee giving up some rights in favor of the employer. So it could be at raise time. Uh, I've seen it done with the stock options, uh, promotion, or, or something like that. So that's exactly. the first thing. Yeah, yeah. I guess, Tom, maybe, maybe I can, um, I, think, I think Michael's right on the mark from a legal perspective, uh, from, from some practical experience over time and in different businesses as well. You know, to, to, to me, I think most of the, the, uh, the companies that are part of MTI will find that they have plenty of legacy holes in their, their uh, paperwork with their employees. Many employees could go back years and years. Um, from my standpoint, as an ongoing process, whether or not you're a commercial heat treater or for us uh, providing equipment to a customer base, since we are uh, being, being asked in an ongoing way to conduct business by accepting NDA agreements by our customers or ultimately paying the bills, um, we appeal to the group by simply saying, hey, we did an audit to fulfill our commitments to our customers. We want to make sure that you're all aware of the information that we're, some of us handle, you know, and, and what our obligations are for that. Um, and at the same time, I want to remind you of what our expectations are with our information. And I'm not sure from, from that standpoint, I can just tell you that uh, people that are exposed to, to customer information and our information that uh, we felt could, uh, without being reminded, take something and do something they shouldn't with, we, we asked them to sign. I don't believe we had any, this isn't, a, to me, this isn't an unreasonable request. Um, and if you happen to have an employee from my standpoint that had, had felt, well, hey, you know, I think that any information I have here at the company, I should be able to control and take. Now, maybe you're just heading off a problem sooner and having that discussion with the employee. Um, because clearly there's there's probably a gap between your commitments to to not only your customers but internal expectations. So um, whether or not you do it at raise time or not, uh, I, I looked at it and I would look at it as these are obligations we have to conduct day to day business in the in the environment we're in. We're just reminding everybody this is what our obligations are, and here's the document to say we talked about it. I'd be surprised if many of these employees would object to it in our environment. Right, right. So, so hearing all that and hearing what we've talked about, I mean, I think we've. Come, I think I want to congratulate uh, Bill, you and your task force, and Michael, your team, with you and Jerry Anders on the work that y'all did over the course. I think it's like four or five conference calls and a lot of a lot of information changing hands to put these five or six documents together. I think they're going to be very vital to a lot of members using them. So. Kind of, in, kind of in closing before we get final thoughts. And, and if you do, please, if you have any questions before we end, please type them in. We've been answering those. And uh, here's one that's, that's come up from Bob as, as we're looking at that. So, Michael and Bob, Bill, what would you say to anyone on this on this webcast who has a very, I don't say lazy, but they just they have a very lackadaisical kind of strategy for dealing with NDAs and 
employee protection for their company, what would you say to them to, would, that would maybe help them put them in the mindset that, okay, I need to really get, get really serious about this in this day and age. And I think you brought up a good point, Mike, with so many things being electronic and transferable, what, what could happen if someone is lackadaisical in this area of NDAs and, and documentation with employees? Well, I would, I would try to keep the uh, forms uh, simple. As Bill says, um, it would be a, you know, a danger signal if, if someone, you know, balked at, uh, you know, not, not signing, um, you know, con uh, receipt of the employee manual. And, and if you explain it to them reasonably to balk at not signing over uh, confidentiality and the like. Um, so I, I would keep the, uh, the, the form simple and, uh, you know, try to explain from the employer's perspective, the, a practical necessity uh, for these forms uh, to, you know, not only to protect the interest of the company itself, uh, but also the trust posed in the, in the company by its uh, customers. And, you know, I find um, when these things get testified about in, in, in court, if they're explained in reasonable fashion like that, um, it, it, it generally uh, come, comes out all right. Awesome. Any comments from you, Bill, on that? Well, yeah, I think, you know, maybe if we're wrapping up here, Tom, I think uh, I'm not looking at our time here, but um, it might be good to just make sure that everybody understands these documents in, in conclusion as well. We've had a lot of some detailed discussion, but, you know, I, I just want to encourage everyone to, to look through a lot of this as best practices. Uh, some of the, the things I think that the team – we should acknowledge uh, the team. I know Bob is online here, Bob Ferry, and other people that worked on the task team. Um, we tried to look at, we'll say the gotchas. You know, there's comments in, in these best practices on how to minimize uh, signing documents that will make the MTI standard terms and conditions void. Um, it's not perfect, but it's it's helpful. Attorney fee clauses. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the battle of documents. Um, I think that having some, uh, some of the things in here are, are practical as well as legal. If we're doing contract documents and there's disagreements, um, these documents talk about uh, what we, we discussed as a team on, yeah, it'd be perfect to, if we could just strike all these out and the customer would say, okay, we accept your changes. But we all know the reality for, for people running businesses if you strike a bunch of things out of a legal document coming from the customer, the odds of, of getting them accepted is not so great if you're asking for acknowledgement. Sometimes where we find a happy middle ground, in my opinion, is maybe making some of the changes you think are most important to an NDA that a customer is sending you or even a purchase order that you're getting if you're reviewing the terms. And you, you, you can make those changes in initial and send them back with the acknowledgement. You'd love, you know, it's great to ask for confirmation that they accept them all, but all of us might have to make that balance on saying, hey, you know, you're a lot better having responded with some documentation saying, hey, I accepted it, but with these conditions. Not near as good as having them say, I accept the conditions, but I'm sure legally you're in much better shape with that than just accepting them without uh, contesting any of the, do uh, the comments, and you might have a better chance of getting getting some solace that you tried to get the uh, the bad terms out of that document. But I just encourage everyone to look at the documents and there may be other questions, Tom. I'm not sure if there's a forum where if they, they'd like to ask me any questions specific to this, I'd be happy to uh, to give any answers as, as possible as we go through them. Yeah, we, well, I'll touch on that in just a second. Those are some great comments. Uh, Michael, just Bob Hill asked one follow-up question in terms of, I think it's a very detailed, good question, but you know, fax transmissions, you had a time date stamp on them, but I got them and emails. How have you seen best practices of, I mean, you know, hey, I didn't get that. It went in my spam folder or something. I mean, it, are the, how are the emails being handled for that transaction? Well, well, if it went into your, your spam folder, it went into your spam folder and presumably you never saw it. But, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by questions about emails that, you know, I hear from clients all the time. And, you know, email has been with us a long time now. But, you know, email is, is just as strong, if not uh, st stronger, than uh, letters or faxes or, or any other sort of document. 
I mean, they're used with devastating effect uh, in court in, in, in all kind, kinds of cases. And, you know, they're the language of business uh, and virtually everything else today. And then it even gets more complicated when you go into social media and, you know, uh, Facebook and everything else. I mean, you literally have uh, thoughts that, you know, would have occurred to you that you never even would have spoken out loud that now you put in an email and send off. So right. yes, in a battle of the forum situation, which would be typical in this um, industry uh, where, uh, you know, a, a quote gets sent with terms A and a, a receipt goes back with terms B and a purchase order and a you know, everything, an invoice, you know, it gets pretty complicated and uh, sometimes difficult to add up. It's unclear what is the foundational uh, document that is the contract between the parties. So, you know, the e emails will absolutely be, be crucial. And I do agree with what uh, Bill said about um, if you're troubled by terms and you want to give yourself a hook later to, to write a letter or to send an email, and, uh, you know, to you know, fight, fight back, you have to do it in a nuanced way so you don't, don't lose the contract if, if, you, if you really don't want to uh, lose it. And you should know it may not work when, um, if, the, if the case goes uh, to court, but it might give you a, a leg, leg to stand on. And you know, at the end of the day, you might not have anything to lose by sending a letter like that. But uh, with regard to the emails, I can't emphasize enough how, how important they are and in, in, a, in a modern court case today if you haven't been involved in one for a while you're going to get discovery requests asking for all uh, the uh, e-discovery um, and it's uh, very uh, expensive in, in some cases and it can uh, uh, win the case or lose the case for you. Right. Is it important to uh, Michael for the group to ask for delivery and read receipts? Uh, in, in my opinion, no. I mean, uh, a trial or an injunction uh, hearing uh, is going to be best conducted just in the natural way business is done. Um, I mean, if part of your business is to get uh, read receipts, I suppose so, but you know, generally it's not, at least in my experience. And you know, when I cross-examine someone in court with an email, you know, I hold it, hold it up in front of me and I say, is it true that 10.31 p.m. on Tuesday, September 14th, uh, 2016, you received an email in red, da, da 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 and it said this, because it's just all, it's all right there. It, you know, it's, it's easy, the cross-examination the cross is written for the lawyer and all he has to do is read it off. I wasn't sure if the uh, the read receipts would actually uh, uh, help in a case like that so that you couldn't get somebody saying, oh, no, I never saw that. It, it must have been put in my spam folder. Well, uh, I, I don't know that I've had a case yet where the uh, spam folder came in <laughs> to play. But, uh, e e emails generally are presumed to have been sent and received. Okay. And very rarely, very rarely have ever seen anyone deny that they got an email or at the very least they said you know i don't remember seeing it now but you know i must have got it because it's you know right here with the name of your your server and and then in uh, modern discovery the pre the documents as you know are produced in a huge group and they're often numbered by the attorneys when they're um produced so there'll be a prefix for the plaintiff or the defendant or one of the other parties and then there'll be a sequential number, which can go into the hundreds of the thousands, the tens of thousands and beyond. And that's very difficult to deny that it didn't come off your server and that you saw it or you certainly should have seen it. Right. Well, that was a good comment. So a couple of things before we end. So if, if anybody listening to this has any questions whatsoever on this topic, you can go to your MTI app and post it in the open forum, or if you can go out and log in, to the uh, heattreat.net, our website, and you can click post discussion on the right-hand side in the get connected box. Start a discussion and say, hey, I've got a question on NDAs, and Bill's tied into that. He can easily chime back in. Another resource, documents. you go out to heattreat.net and log in and click the members only button tab and click resource library. 
And there is a folder called General MTI Documents. That's where you'll find the statement limit liability. You'll find all these forms. They're all easily downloadable right from that place. So um, what I want to say before in closing, Bill, thank you so much for your time. Mike, I know you are very busy. And you're not going to want to miss the November issue of Heat Treat Tuesday because finding good people is the number one challenge with everybody. And another task force is uh, the board has approved a partnership with Bradley Morris that you've seen on our website where you're going to be able to tap into the 200,000 plus military veterans coming out of the military in an average age of less than 30, most of them. And so we're going to be talking about how you can tap into those and have them work for you to find you the right people for the right job and the right company in the right place. So hope you will look out that information. So Michael, Bill, thank you so much and, for all and, you've done today and all the information. And as one, one last uh, parting, uh, thank you. I, I want to uh, take note of the other uh, MTI team members that uh, spent a lot of time with this. Yeah. And uh, Bob Fury and uh, Cole Co. I don't know if Cole was on, but I know Bob was uh, on the call. They spent quite a bit of time with, uh, with our group and I think it was great that MTI sponsored the investment on behalf of the MTI members to put some documents together and certainly uh, for everybody signing on, ask us any questions you've got to make sure you put them to use and protect yourself in the best way possible. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, everybody, for attending. We'll see you next month on Heat Treat. Have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Bye -bye.